Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the UFC card for this Saturday from a DFS perspective. And for those of you that are watching this for the first time, uh, once again, we separate the DFS content into two separate videos. One, which we do today, uh, usually Thursday, where we go over kind of fight by fight, go over the best plays, which fighters have good upside, which fighters to fade, things like that. And then on Saturday morning, usually, or sometimes late Friday night, we do a lineup construction video where all we do is figure out how to develop a portfolio of lineups to beat the, you know, the, the big MME lottery contest. And these are completely two different skills. They're somewhat related, but uh, I do like to sep uh, separate these into two separate videos. Uh, in addition to that, tomorrow we're going to have a contrarian betting breakdown, which is a lot of fun. And uh, we actually did very, very well last week with the actual results, which don't really matter all too much when, when it comes to uh, that particular uh, uh, breakdown. Anyway, uh, let's get started. And it's, it's important to remember before we get into this, the, the difference between DFS and betting. Um, and and I, I know I've gone over this a million times, but remember what the main concept of DFS with respect to projecting results is the assumption that the Vegas lines are somewhat accurate. Okay. And, and it is a, you know, it's an assumption that you just sort of have to make when you're beginning to analyze DFS uh, projections and analyze DFS uh, slates. Now, if you feel as though you have such a huge edge where you would rather not presume that the lines are accurate, then I direct you to the betting streets, you know, to, to, you know, to take advantage of that. However, you know, I was talking with uh, a couple of people and I talked to people about this a lot. If you do in fact have an edge or you feel you have an edge in, in analyzing these lines that Vegas uh, kind of puts out or agrees upon, maybe just maybe you're better off not playing, you know, playing that out in the betting streets, but maybe playing it out in DFS because DFS, the way projections are created by the industry, and as a result, usually ownership follows this, is based on the Vegas odds. So if you can come up with even one or two lines that you feel are completely off, yeah, you can go ahead and try to beat the, the you know, the 40 cent VIG or whatever in, in the prop market, but you, you might be better off just trying to apply that to DFS because, you know, most DFS projection models do not have opinions, you know, on, on where the fights are going to go. And, and there are a couple of examples of that as we get through these, uh, through these fights, where the way you analyze it for a betting perspective or a who's going to win perspective or whatever is just completely different than, than how you deal with DFS. So in any case, let's just get started. Uh, first fight of the night, Shylon, you're in Becky versus uh, Malik uh, Mel's Costa. Uh, 8,500 versus 7,700. Let's just first take a look at the money line, make sure that it's uh, somewhat reasonable. Yeah, so Costa minus 185, and they're calling him something else here. Um, whatever, we know who it is. It's just sometimes they put different names out there. Anyway, uh, I guess this is a little bit cheap for a minus 180 favorite, but again, the way that they price these things on DraftKings is it's relative pricing. So uh, he's, you know, it depends on what other fighters are priced above him, whether he's going to be an $8,500 fighter that's 180, or maybe some days, if there are not as many big favorites, maybe the minus 180 favorite is going to end up being 9K. But today he's, he's 8,500. And uh, Beke, obviously, to make up that $16,200 price, uh, he's 77. So there's no real money line value that I can see. It's really just going to come down to whether either of these guys have upside with respect to their finishing odds or, or possible takedown upside. Now, as far as the takedown upside is concerned, um, both these guys can wrestle a little bit, but it's not guaranteed that that's the, what they're going to do. And it's not required that they do that to get wins. So, and it's important to understand that because when, when you're trying to analyze things from a DFS perspective, you're trying to figure out not whether someone's going to win, but what happens if, in fact, they do win. And I don't think that either of these fighters are the pure wrestler types where you can say that if either of these fighters win, it's going to come with 
a great amount of takedowns and control time and things like that. There's always a certain percentage that that would apply to, but I don't think it's agreed just here. So we're really just kind of relying on their finishing upside. And we can, we look at the Vegas odds and we see that Nuren Becky inside is plus 325, which is, which is an inside the distance line would be good if he was like 7,200 or something or 7K, but 7,800, this is just really poor. And close to inside the distance plus 185. Um, I would say that's on the poor side, not atrocious, but definitely on the poor side to the point where I would say that, that this fight, at least for starters, is probably somewhat of a fade. We'll see what the other fights kind of bring us. Um, now, again, this is a 13 fight card not a 14 fight card. So, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's going to be difficult to get unique um, where the 14 fight card is a little easier. As I say that last week was a huge chop for first. And anyway, that's for the line of construction piece. But the point is, is that in a 13 fight card, while we are, you know, looking for, I don't know, a little less upside, I guess. I don't want to say it the wrong way, but, in a 13 fight car, we don't have to be as selective of which underdogs we take. You still have to have some degree of upside. So I really don't think that this fight is particularly worth targeting. Um, if you get to it in, in 150 max, sure. But uh, as far as overall viability, I don't think it's that good. All right. Uh, Joanne or something, Knudsen? Is it Joanne? Knudsen against uh, Palastri, 9,100, 7,100. And this is actually pretty interesting. I mean, for, for a minus 175 plus 150 price tag, well, actually, it's a little bit closer to minus 200. I don't know, minus 180 plus 150. This is um this is a pretty pretty healthy price for for uh for Knudsen, you know. Uh for someone who is minus 190 or so, to place her all the way up at 9100, that's that's Pretty expensive. Um, so she, she's going to need a pretty good inside the distance line and or um, some good takedown upside to, to, to justify this price. And, and when you look at the inside the distance line, it's it's really poor, I think. Um, yeah, Newton inside is plus 375. Well, if she didn't have wrestling upside, I would consider this literally a 0% owned option. Okay. Um, and, and, and Palastri plus 575 inside the distance. I mean, this is, this is kind of atrocious. The the only thing is that Palastri at least has some money line value, you know, at, at her price at 7,100. I mean, she wins the fight often enough where you can almost make the case that even with no upside, she, she's not bad. And if this were like an 11 fight card, I mean, this is these are the type of just kind of awful no upside fighters you're probably supposed to target someone like Palastri. As a matter of fact, I, I think this is not the worst idea in the world. Um, again, know what you're getting yourself into. I mean, if it ends up being a really high scoring uh, card, you're not going to do anything with 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 Palastri. But just because of her win odds and her price, I think she's in play. The the Newton play is interesting because, as I mentioned, she doesn't have a good inside the distance line at all. But it's been argued that she has a lot of takedown upside. And when I say it's been argued, um, you know, a lot of the content out there is saying that she's she had issues with takedown defense herself. So what she did was she kind of worked on her entire wrestling game and to the point where now she's actually can do some offensive wrestling as well. And Palashi apparently is not very good on the ground. So if you could get it going where, where Knudsen goes for all those takedowns, and gets them that she might even be able to get there in a decision. Okay. In her last fight, she was against Malik Mann, who's who's pretty awful. Um, but nonetheless, three round decision, three takedowns, and control the fight four minutes per per round was good for a 110, which would be which would be fine here. Um uh so I I don't know what to do about this. You know, she's inside the distance line is so poor that she's going to need almost exactly like this. You know, it's and it's hard to get 12 minutes of control time. OK, um, that's that's very, very difficult to do. So 
I don't know. I still think that given the fact that her inside the distance line is so poor and the fact that it's possible that she doesn't even go for the same, same game plan, she could or should, but maybe she doesn't. And if she doesn't, then she's going to win probably. And you're not going to get there. So I think she's fine. Uh, I do not consider her a priority at all. As a matter of fact, in a weird way, you know, in single entry, I, I might even prefer the Palashi side because of that money line value. But let, let's see the West rest of this card before we get tied down to this one. So, so far through two two fights, really not a lot. Okay, uh, fight number three, Jekka Saragai versus Weston Wilson. 9,300, 6,900. So, for this price, you're going to need – you're really going to need a first-round knockout or – and or right? uh, an early finish coupled with a whole bunch of takedowns. And I mean, fortunately, when you look at the at the metrics here, Sergey looks really, really good. It's inside the distance line is minus two fifty, and even when you go to round one, he's minus one thirty. So that's extremely strong. Um, and so, it, even though ninety three hundred or whatever is a pretty lofty price, his metrics certainly support it. So we're we're definitely going to put him in. Um, can he get takedowns as well? Yeah, maybe. I mean, he got a takedown in his last fight, sort of, but this was just kind of a quick quick KO or whatever. But I don't know. I mean, you look at him, he's fought two two fights in the UFC. He's got, got KO'd in round two in his first fight to someone who was not that great. And then, yeah, he got a pretty uh, pretty cool, uh, pretty cool uh, upset KO in his last fight. But let's take a look at his log here for just a second just just for the hell of it yeah i mean going into that he has a whole bunch of of, of ko's he has decision down here so i guess he's probably legit so we'll 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 we'll, we'll put him in for now as the best favorite and maybe we'll get rid of him later but there's no denying this that that those metrics you know when you're a favorite to win in the first round 9300 is actually very very reasonable um, all right, uh, Fernandez versus uh, uh, Ju Carly Judas or Judice, whatever. So female underdogs have been really coming in recently, and uh, not to say that that's, that's to indicate that they should be coming in in the future, but nonetheless, I mean, what happens is, is most female fights don't carry with them a lot of finishing upside. So when you get fights that go to decision, judges have been very, very variant, to put it mildly, in their views of the fights um so whenever you put yourself in a position where the judges are going to decide it the underdog i guess by almost by definition should the, the 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 line should tighten a little bit you know um so you have fernandez at 9k like for example and let's look at her inside the distance line for openers i'm sure it's not going to be very good i mean plus 170 at 9k is really not very good and this one's plus one for just a little better, but so if you're going to rely on her winning by a decision, I mean you're you're kind of asking for it. Um, I will say that it's possible. I was about to say she might have taken that upside, but I'm just kind of making that up. You know, like she hasn't really shown all that much of that, so it just seems like just kind of an awful nine k prospect here. Judice on the other side, her inside the distance line is extremely poor. Let's look at the the money line though. Again, look at this. So you have oh, this is kind of crazy. You have minus one sixty plus one thirty, and you can get seventy two hundred. I mean, this is even better than the Palastri play, right? Yeah. So we could replace the Palastri with the Judice just on money line. You know, and this is usually what we don't do, right? You usually need a good amount of upside, even though you have an underdog here. But I don't know. I mean, this money line is very, very tempting. So uh, Judice, I, I do like. And I like her more than Fernandez at these prices. Do I think she's going to win? I don't, I don't know. I don't care. The fact is, she's going to win the fight according to the odds by about 40% of the time. And she's, you know, she's 7,200. All right, uh, moving on, we have Adam Fugit versus Josh Quinlan. This is very strange. You know, you have, and we'll talk about this in the in the 
betting breakdown, but you have an 8,300, 7,900 fight. And we'll take a look at the odds here. We have Quinlan is, you know, minus 130, which is probably what he's supposed to be. But I'll say this, and this will be a lead into my betting breakdown. You have about 99% of the people picking Quinlan, um, even though the price is minus 120. And I think you know what I'm going to end up doing on the betting streets here. But we, we can't we can't get too into that with respect to, uh, to DFS. But maybe we can a little bit because if everybody's analyzing this and really think Quinlan's the side, maybe he's going to be owned more than even his odds indicate, you know? Um, but let, let's, 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 let's look at the inside the distance line. So Quinlan inside the distance plus 135, and that's extremely strong. I mean, like it, it's a, it's, it's a really, really strong inside the distance line for a, a $8,300 fighter. Um, we've already gone over like nine K fighters that don't have this inside the distance line, for example. So this is why Quinlan's going to be a very, you know, very popular play, I would imagine. People like him anyway, even though the odds are kind of pick him. And he has a very strong inside the distance line. It's going to look like a really good play. But I certainly, for a lot of reasons, I'm going to want to get some of the Fugit side as well. Number one, I should say number one A, but number one is the fact that Quinlan's looks so good that I mentioned he's going to be very popular. So whatever you could find an excuse to play the opponent of someone that's going to be really popular. You could be a lot more liberal with, with your metrics. You know, you, you don't have to have him be an amazing play to be playable when you're facing someone who's going to be really popular. So you look at his inside the distance line for, for his price. It's actually really poor. I mean, plus 275 is really not great, but I don't know. He, he, he gets takedowns, doesn't he? I mean, he got a takedown and finish over uh, Kinoshita in his, very surprising uh, victory. I think that might have been in Singapore, actually, with a big old 126 point uh, result. So I don't know. I, I like both sides of this fight. And I think Fug, it's actually going to end up being some pretty good leverage. And then when we get into lineup construction techniques, I might even consider playing Fugit and leaving 400 on the table. This way, you get extra uniqueness because I promise you that if there's, you know, you have a five, if you have five of your six fighters that are selected already by the optimizer or whatever, and there's 8,300 left, they're going to give you Quinlan, you know, and they will never give you Fugit because Quinlan just projects higher. So if you play Fugit and leave that 400 on the table and get to him in those types of lineups, you're going to be very, very unique. Um, so I think Fugit's an extremely strong bit of GPP leverage and Quinlan is obviously a very, very good play. Okay, Nate Maness versus Jimmy Flick, another very wide um, uh, DraftKings salary uh, discrepancy here. You have Nate Maness, 9,400, and Flick is 6,800. And the money line is probably extremely wide here as well. So you have Maness is minus 600. Okay, so that's just really, really big. Okay, uh, and... But that doesn't mean that you should play him. You know, you had Brad Katona, who was minus 500 last week, and we thought that was, you know, pretty easy fade because of his inside the distance line. Uh, footnote, he actually got there because he got a whole bunch of takedowns and, and ground control. He still got 108 points, but it's still still the analysis is still this, you know, still holds. So Maness, I mean, he's going to remain, a, he's going to need a pretty good inside the distance line to say the least, but I think he has one. Let's see. Nate Maness inside is minus 285. This is pretty much the same, if not better, than Fugit. Uh, excuse me, than um, what's the name? Uh, Jekka from that previous fight. And you look at his, even his round one, it's like, it's not as good as the other one, but, but minus 110 or minus, I mean, that's really, really good. And, and you factor in the fact that he's also going to probably get a, be able to get some takedowns because Flick doesn't mind getting taken down. This is a kind of an elite favorite here. So I, I definitely like this. Um, with respect to the other side, I mean, Flick is intriguing in, in the sense that when he wins, a submission is, is rather likely. Like you look at him, it says Flick wins by submission is plus 500 and his odds to win are like plus 400, you know? So, so the point is, is that in his wins, he's going to get finishes 
a good amount of the time. Um, so that in and of itself would make you probably want to play him. The only issues are that his submissions usually don't come with much of anything else. You know, he doesn't really get takedowns. He just either lets himself get taken down or just kind of just gets from the standing position. These weird, like flying arm triangle, triangles and stuff like that. So he might get a submission and not really score all that well, but we don't worry too much about that at his price. So Maness is going to look extremely good as from all the reasons I just mentioned. And Flick, because you're following this, right? Because Maness looks really good, Flick is going to be a pretty decent bit of leverage. Okay, so Maness and Flick, both of these guys are, are very much in. Now, again, the, the real, only real problem with Flick is he doesn't really win too often. You know, he's going to win like, what, you know, what, 20% of the time at best? Um, so that's why, I mean, some of these fighters might even be better. Like, is it better? Like, what does is, what is Judice look like in a win? I mean, probably like 50 or 60 point decision, right? And Flick... Could get could get a hundred, right? And you could get a first round sub. Why not? Um, but it just doesn't happen as often, so it's it's tough. But I definitely flick see, think Flick is in play, as well as obviously Maness, very very elite favorite. I think between so far between Maness and Saragai, we'll take out the underdogs for a minute. Like like these are the three plays right now. You know Maness Saragi. Quinlan, I mean, you have two elite inside the distance lines, and this one is really, really strong for his price as well. All right, moving on, we have Tagir Ulanbekov versus uh, Joshua Van. Um, so we do have a, a pretty stark clash of styles here. I mean, Ulanbekov is, well, not stark clash, but Ulanbekov is okay with the striking, but he's known more for his, his wrestling prowess. And Joshua Van, you know, he can grapple a little bit, but he's much more known for his striking. So you have the striker versus grappler matchup. And we're going to get to another one in a second, the Garrett Armfield, Brady Heastan. And, and the analysis there is going to be a little more dramatic with respect to the point I'm going to make. But let's start with this one. You know, judges have not been particularly kind to wrestlers in the past you know year or so i mean they really want fighters that are not only going to get takedowns but do something with them either get submissions or a lot of ground and pound and they really reward the strikers that getting good significant strikes in or a good volume so if you play ulan bekov you know your path to victory is you know, your best path, your best path to victory is going to be getting a bunch of takedowns and taking that grappling route and then, but you run the risk of, of getting that bad decision. Okay, that is all true. But that's not a DFS argument. In other words, DFS, again, going back to the original concept, it presumes that these lines are right. In other words, we don't care about the variations where Uwen Bekov gets robbed. Okay, because that's already factored in to the line to some degree, right? So all we have to think about is how he does in his wins relative to what his price is. And Ulan Bekoff at 8,900, he's got a very strong inside the distance line, plus 115. I mean, it's not like elite level, but it's certainly great. I mean, good. Plus his takedowns. I mean, this is a very, very strong play. And people might be, you know, dissuaded from playing him because, you know, Judges have not been particularly kind to him. And also, Joshua Van is he's really good. You know, people people love playing Joshua Van. Well, they love Joshua Van in general. He's gonna be a very popular underdog, I imagine, in the betting streets. Um, and when you have a, an underdog like this that people have bet on before, I mean, he has two two wins in the UFC, one of them as the underdog in a very, very similar fight. Like you look at this at this fight like two fights ago or three fights ago against Zuma Gulov. This was back at the Jacksonville card, and he was, um, you know, and Van was awesome at 7,200. Uh, all kinds of volume, 
And people were, you know, betting. You know, they were, they they like they liked Juma Gulov because they thought Juma Gulov was going to get takedowns. And the weird thing is, is that they were concerned that Juma Gulov might lose a split. It turns out that Dan was pretty much unanimous, I think, across the board here. So, so the point is, is that people are used to seeing him win. So when you're kind of starved for underdogs in general, you are, you know, I think the public is going to go to Van quite a bit. So I think that Ulan Bekov is an extremely strong $8,900 fighter. I don't think he's going to be that popular because, number one, people are afraid now, I think, of, of, of what could happen in these grappler versus striker decisions. And also just the fact that Van is probably going to be a pretty popular underdog. So I think Ulan Bekov's ownership is going to stay in, ch in, 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 in check. And he's got the metrics to support, you know, this this price tag, to say the least. Now, I did mention that Van is probably going to look like a decent underdog. And, yeah, I guess so. He's 7,300. But, I mean, look at this. Like, what, his, his odds are worse than some of these other $7,200 fighters for, we talked about. So what are we getting out of Joshua Van aside from kind of a, you know, kind of a crappy money line? I mean, you look at his inside the distance line. Let's see. Hey, plus 475, that's terrible. You know, the, the only thing I would say is that he, he can put up volume, but he's a, he's, a, he's a notoriously slow starter. And where's that volume coming from if he's, he's controlled for like half the fight? I mean, he still could get this win, um, but he could get a win without the volume really needed to score all that well. And, and the fact that you know, Ulam Bekov is not going to be that popular, I don't think. I think that Van is going to be the one that's too popular. I think that's my my analysis. I mean, if you look at just the numbers, like how is Van? I, I know the answer. How is Van better than Julia Palastri? I mean, that sounds kind of ridiculous to say, right? Like, like who's going to play Julia Palastri, or for that matter, Carly Judice, over um um what's his name? Joshua Van. Well, the inside the distance lines are all really bad. You know, I mean, don't, don't say that, oh, Joshua Van's inside the distance lines better because it's plus 450 as opposed to these others plus 600 or whatever. Um, the only thing that makes Van better is because of the possibility to get the volume. So I think that, I think Van is probably going to be the big sucker bet in, in DFS this week that people play too much. That's my opinion. All right, let's, um, let's move on. We have Garrett Armfield versus Brady Heastan. Okay, so here is here is here's a better reason. So Garrett Armfield's 8,700, Brady Heastan is 7,500. So we expect to see like a minus 180 or something like that in the money line. Let's take a look. Um, yeah, about that. So there's no more money line odds here. But I will say this. For a minus 180 favorite, he's certainly being touted like he's minus 600. All right. Um, there's so much love for the armfield side here that I do think that his ownership, even in DFS, is probably going to be a little higher than it maybe it should be. Um, we'll take a look at his metrics in a minute. The thing is, is that Brady Haystan, his path to victory is unfortunately, but fortunately for me, not a style that is particularly favored right now. You know, Brady Haystan, his path to victory is going to be getting taken. And probably, you know, maybe not doing too much with them, you know, because that's just the way way he is. Um, but he, he certainly does, you know, he, he can let his hands go, but his style is not conducive to, to, to the judges right now, okay? So people are kind of afraid to play him. However, that, that's really just not even the point. The point is, is that we don't care – about all those variations where he gets his takedowns and loses because those are the ones that are not part of this money line. You know, the money line is what it is. And if you think this money line is inaccurate because of the, you know, because of the judges, then go bet in the money, you know, bet in, in, in the betting streets, whatever. I don't think that you get better value with that, with that opinion here. Um, my just point is that if in fact Brady Heastan does win, He's going to score well enough to justify his $7,500 price tag. And he is, you know, he wins often enough here. Um, so you give me six takedowns, right? Um, three take. I mean, this is going to be just fine. 
I mean, honestly. I mean, these, you didn't really see him do too much with them, whatever. The control time was, was good, but the, the, um, the, uh, the strikes were uh, not so, the, uh, the control time is not good. This is weird. So it says that he stands, oh, he beat Garcia? Oh, Fernie Garcia. So I, I think he stands a really, really good play in DFS. I just do. Now let's take a look at the other side, though, because um, Armfield, I think, is going to be, I don't know if people are really going to pull the trigger in DFS, but they're certainly touting the betting streets. But let's just see. Armfield inside is plus 175. I and mean, what's so great about that? That's not so great. So I, I, I don't really like the armfield side in DFS here at all. Um, I think if anybody, I would probably take the he stand side. Look, his inside the distance line is poor. But when you get – when your path to victory involves takedowns and, and almost exclusively, it's just the guy that you're going to want to play as long as the money line is reasonable. So, so I think he stands a very, very solid underdog. I'll probably end up fading the – I mean, not fading completely, but – I don't, I don't think I'm going to have a lot of love for the, uh, for the arm field side of DFS for all the reasons I mentioned. Asu Almabaya versus Joe Johnson, a very, very huge inside the disc, a huge uh, discrepancy in price, which is going to reflect his money line, which is minus 600. So what, what do you need? Here? You know, we talked about Jekka at 9,300, but his metrics were. We talked about, um, what's his name? Nate Maness. At his, you know, what his metrics were at 9,400 or whatever. What do you need? Well, let's see what he's got. Like Almabayev, inside the distance, minus 140. I mean, that's that's fine, you know, but but that's not even enough. I mean, you got to get either round one or a bunch of takedowns. And his round one upside is not that great. He's minus, he's plus 200 to finish in round one, which is worse than the other two that we mentioned between Maness and, um, and Jekka, take a look at his takedowns, maybe, Almabayev. I mean, he had nine takedowns against Vergara, which is – that that's and that's what's concerning when you want to uh, to fade somebody like this, okay, is that you, you end up getting a situation where the guy might get like seven, eight takedowns and the sub. So I, I think that, that this takedown upside kind of overcomes – sort of the lack of, a, of, a, of an inside the distance line that's commensurate with his price. So we're going to include him right alongside these other favorites uh, as good favorites. Maness, Almabayev, and and, um, and, and, and Saragi. And the other side, Joe Johnson, Joe Jose Johnson he doesn't win often enough. He's, I'm not playing that. All right, Douglas De Silva de Andrade against Miles Johns. So, so the... The money line uh, and and the pricing is is such that you have to respect it. In other words, the 8,200 8K fight, it makes so many other things work in your lineups that you have to really be very liberal about what type of metrics you need here. But even so, I mean, you got to have something. And, and you look at this, you have Douglas De Silva, the Andrade inside is plus 200. That's actually pretty good. And John's inside the distance is plus 400. So it's clear that the better play here is Silva de Andrade, unless, you know, John's has an incredible amount of takedown upside, which will make up for that. Now, you do see that he does, can, he can get takedowns, right? Um, but he doesn't always go for takedowns. So he does get involved in this, in, in a kind of a striking battle. Uh, John's is, is, is going to have a problem. So if anybody, I, I actually do like the Douglas to Silva Dan Drod side. I think that that money, that, that inside the distance line for his price is good enough to put him in the mix. I actually do prefer him over the miles John side. And that's just in DFS. I, mean, I, I don't really know who's going to win. We'll talk, we'll talk about betting angles in the, in the betting breakdown tomorrow. Timothy Kwamba versus Lucas Almeida. Um, so we have minus 190-ish on you know uh in the money line. And it's pretty reasonable. It's kind of like what his what the actual pricing is. I can't imagine either of these fighters having a good inside the distance line, but we'll take a look at it. It actually doesn't even oh, it does say. So we have 
Columba inside is plus 130. That's actually better than I thought it was going to be. Um, what about the other side of this? I'm not getting an Almeida inside the distance line yet. I'm just getting Almeida by decision. It's weird. But Almeida by TKO plus 350. I guess that's pretty pretty close to what it is. So it's inside the distance line. I think we're going to say is plus 400. That's just not going to be good enough. Uh, but I think Quam, boy, can you play Quamba? I will say this. I think of all the favorites we've mentioned so far, this could end up being the lowest owned. I mean, split decision, 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 decision. This is rough. So I think in, in 150, I, I, I think I'm going to end up getting over on this guy. Um, and that's really scary. I'm definitely not playing him in 20 matches or below. But considering his inside the distance line is really no worse than some of these others. Like you look at Kwame, he's 8,800. Let's look at, well, it's not fair to look at Guam Beckoff, but let's look at our, let's look at Armfield, for example. Like Armfield at pretty much the same price. It's 88 versus 8,700. Let's take a look at the different metrics here. So Armfield is plus one. What was he inside the distance again? Armfield inside the distance was like plus 175. You know? And Kwamba's plus, what did we say? 130? Um, yeah, and I, I guarantee you that, that more people are going to play Armfield. I can't guarantee you, right? More people are going to play Armfield than, than this guy. More people are going to play Ulan Bekov than this guy, although, again, Ulan Bekov has a good combination of takedowns and the finishing upside. But this, this could be some, some interesting, uh, an interesting contrarian play action. Almeida, we already saw his, not only are his metrics poor, but as we just kind of mentioned, Kwamba is, I don't think anybody's going to play him, which means that Almeida is not going to really get any good leverage. So I do like the Kwamba side. All right, uh, Tricoli versus Ali Skera. So we have a $9,700 price, which, you know, you don't see that too often. And, you know, for $9,700, you're just going to have to, you're just going to have to put up a big, big boy score. And the only way you're going to do that is getting either a, a first round KO in the first minute. Okay. That's one way to do it. Another is a first round finish that is accompanied by one or more takedowns and a whole bunch of ground and pound. Or maybe, just maybe, a second round finish where you had a whole bunch of takedowns and control time and then sub, sub them at the end with ground and pin. I mean, it's a very specific type of, of result that gets you the price that you need for this type of guy. Um, his inside the distance line is uh, what? Let's see. Ali Scarra of inside the distance is minus 650. I mean, but we don't really care. I mean, we're going to presume he's going to finish him, but it's going to be when. Let's look at round one. It's got to be minus 200 or something. Yeah, so round one is minus 200, but even round one is not enough. Some, he's got to get it done in the first minute or have it come with a bunch of takedowns So, so or one takedown and a, and a bunch of control time. So is he the guy that's going to get a whole bunch of takedowns? I'll tell you, it's certainly... I won't say it doesn't look that way, but he's got mostly KOs. But here's a submission, actually. But I don't know. He's had, he's had two fights in the UFC, and both of them, he just stayed on the feet and KO'd the guy. I'm pretty sure that's what he's going to end up trying to do. You know? So what it really comes down to is it's kind of a race against the clock, right? That, that he... If you can, if you can fade, if you fade him, you're really just rooting for 60 seconds. Okay. If he doesn't get him out of there in 60 seconds, he's probably busted. That's, that's, that's the deal because he's not almost, I wouldn't say certainly, but I doubt he really goes to this takedown route. Why would he do that? You know, he has two fights in the USC, both first round KOs where he didn't have to touch the ground. Why, why would he, why would he do anything? Else? So I think that's what he's going to try to do. And it's a 60 second deal, you know? Um, so here you actually would want to look at the props for winning in the first minute. 
Uh, but those are obviously not going to be very liquid and not very, very reflective of anything because it's really just going to be what people want to want to degen for that particular product. So uh, these are the types of guys I usually don't play just because of one minute. Uh, one minute's tough, you know. Maybe Oscar wants to just screw around a little bit. Who knows? Um, but I think that's the the win condition. I think it's a sixty second knockout or or bust. That's my opinion. Uh, so am I going to play him? Maybe. I mean, maybe. If he does get there, you know, which I imagine that he gets there how often? How often does he finish him in the first minute? It's kind of hard to say. 20% of the time? Is, is that is that good enough? I don't know. Probably not. I mean, pro probably if I get to him in GPPs, sure, you know, in, in 150 max, sure, but I'm not playing him in anything big. It's just it's just too narrow of a win condition. And then you get to the main event, uh, Tatsuro Tyra versus Alex Perez. Really, really good main event. Uh, you got Alex Perez, who's been around, uh, but he's not old. He's just been around. He, he was he's considered a contender. And then he took some time off. And this is actually his third was his third fight in three months. Let me just see. Yeah, I mean he was gone from 2020 through 2022. And then he fought after, what, a year and a half off, got subbed by Pantoja in round one. Okay, it is what it is. And then he took a year and a half off after that and fought a kind of a tough fight against Mokayev. And then in a month and a half, came back on short notice and got a second round KO. And now he's back five weeks after that. Um, making up for lost time? I, I, I don't know, but... Uh, very intriguing uh, situation. And then on the other side of this, you have to sure Tyra, who has been doing nothing but, but, mur but, but, but subbing people, you know, or KOing people, you know, since he's gotten into the UFC. Um, his, his competition has not been, you know, the, of the likes of what, what Alex Perez has been facing, but, you know, can't blame him for that. He's a guy who can both strike a little bit and, and certainly a very, very strong grappler. It's a very intriguing matchup. And, and quite honestly, I really don't have an opinion on it. I, I think that five-round fight, I think, is going to help both fighters here. Um, so it's a main event that is probably going to have to be very well respected in, in, in DFS. Uh, we'll look at the inside the distance lines here just for the hell of it. But I'm sure to, Tyra's probably going to be minus 110 inside or something like that, maybe even more. Let's see. Uh, inside is minus one thirty, which is fine. But I mean, what if it's a around four finish? What does that look like? Um, so somewhere along the 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 alt curve, sort of, I think that there's enough finishes and enough takedowns, and you know, he'll get some strikes in there too. That makes some pretty good reason, you know, pretty reasonable play in a five round fight, and and Perez as well. You know, Perez is being the underdog; he has a little more leeway. What's his hit? What's his what's his inside of this line? Plus three thirty, plus three hundred. I'm guessing. I'm guessing. Yeah, plus three hundred. Considering that he's going to probably also get volume or whatever it is. Uh, well, maybe not, but I think he's pretty reasonable as well. And 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 quite honestly, we have not really, we've not really talked about any great underdogs. I mean, we 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 review what we what we have looked at here. I mean, Costa. I mean, Nurembeke. We didn't like. These Palastri and Judices are okay, but they're not scoring anything. You know, they might win, but they're not going to score anything. Fugit is the be I best I can come up with. He's 7,900. That's not that big of a deal. Flick, I guess. But for real, like, how could, I mean, Flick is not a, as good of a play as Alex Perez in a million years. You know, he doesn't win often enough. He doesn't, has no volume. His upside is not as big. Joshua Van, I, I mean, Alex Perez is better win odds, better inside the distance line. He's got five, five, uh, got better inside the distance line. He's got more rounds to work with. So Perez is very, very strong here. You know, he just is very, very strong, uh, very strong underdog. And this whole fight is pretty strong from the DFS perspective. So that is basically the breakdown, uh, fight by fight. I think it's, uh, I do think it's going to be a very low scoring card relative to the what we have been because of the lack of incredibly 
high upside underdogs. And not only that, but you had that fight last week that had the, was basically the AK AK fight that was minus 8 million to finish early. So you could have counted on someone in the AK range scoring over 100, and the guy scored 127. Um, you don't have it this week because that those 8K fights that people are going to jam are, are, are not there. I mean, you have the – I mean, the closest thing I come up with is that um, um, the quinlan Fugit fight, but they're not really jamming that, you know. I don't think Fugit's going to get that that much ownership. And Quinlan will be played, but it's not like he's not like a lock to to score all that great. I mean, he could win a striking base decision and bust everybody. I mean, he really could. Um, and the John's D- Andrade fight. I mean, that's not doesn't have a whole lot of upside. And which of these underdogs are going to bust these favorites? You know, Tricoli? No. I mean, he might, but I don't, I'm not betting on that. I guess he stand is reasonable, right? I, guess, I mean, the more I look at it, I mean, why is he stand not like a really really good play? I mean, you you, start, you play he stand with with Perez, for example, and you make those your underdogs, and then you can almost play whoever you want. You know, you can't quite, but you can play three big favorites. You play Sarah guy, this and this, and then then you could. I'm not building a lineup for you, but then you could punt with uh, one of these one of these uh, play like Pilastri or somebody like that. I mean, I think that's a pretty reasonable cashy type lineup. You know where. Maybe you don't win like the whole hundred thousand or something like that, but I think it's very, very reasonable. Anyway, uh, that'll do it for now. We're going to do a contrarian betting breakdown tomorrow where uh, we have a lot of fun. And then uh, later tomorrow night or Saturday morning, we'll do the lineup construction video. Good luck, everybody.